Hey guys, Luton here back for Below the Line. Now you're probably thinking, what, Wednesday for Below the Line? Yes, uh, I've decided to change it up to a week schedule as I discussed previously. I think that uh, a weekly slot for the series will work a little bit better, gives me a bit more time to prep it up, gives you time to think about it a bit more, gives people time to see the video a bit more. Um, sometimes as well, different news stories can come along. I think always I felt like, well, a week is a little while because a lot can happen in a week and you miss the opportunity to discuss multiple stories. But hey, you know, I mean, maybe I shouldn't just isolate myself to a single day and then what we could do is if I have some urgent topic which needs releasing I can always release an extra video at any other time but maybe keep the regularly scheduled episode for Wednesday so maybe just kind of play a bit more you know flexible and not tie myself into like one specific day so that's my plan from here on out to do Wednesdays so keep that in mind guys Wednesdays for below the line so last time we were talking about how um, Take Two were announcing that they wanted to essentially have kind of microtransactions or some repeatable um, income support, some way of buying stuff from their games in every release from here on out. And I was highlighting the fact that, hey, Red Dead Redemption is right around the corner and a lot of people are looking forward to that game. Is it going to be spoiled and ruined by these kind of practices? So that's what we're talking about today. And then later on, we'll get back into the topic. Obviously, Star Wars is still a really hot topic, um, but I want to talk a little bit more generally around these kind of things. So yeah, join me for part two for that. Right, let's get into your comments. So starting us off is Disciple of Sound who says I basically never buy AAA games immediately post release because I'm tired of the nonsense in them. Even if it means I get deprived of fun games, I know I'm not supporting things I don't like. For example, I've forsaken Battlefront even though I was a big fan of the original 2 on the classic Xbox. I saw what happened to it, I'd rather not throw my money onto the funeral pyre of what I once loved. And I can tell you right now that's an, a sentiment which is echoed with many people that I know around this. He says, as a positive alternative, I do recommend Dark Souls and Bloodborne. I love those games because there's a lot to do in them, ever sans multiplayer, which I don't participate in since I'm only so-so at the games. In addition to the DLCs always being worth the price tag, even without the DLCs, they remain some of my favorite games ever. To conclude, I think that we need to shift our focus in gaming because realistically, microtransactions are not going anywhere unless they stop being profitable. And I do think that is a good point is that these are potentially not going anywhere and that's what we've been talking about is that, you know, 2018 is definitely going to be the year of the microtransaction, you know, as if it hadn't been prolific enough already. Um, but as I say, I really want to get into a kind of wider conversation here that we'll discuss a little bit later on. Okay, next up Dax Owens who says, Profit incentive eventually kills any industry it seeps its way into. The fact gaming has gotten away with being independent of that was very much an outlying rarity in the grander scope of business opportunities. But those chickens are finally coming home to roost now. With the older generation of gamers becoming part-timers, the new generation know no different than the MTS implemented in virtually every major release on the current and future market. As a result, they're okay with it all for the majority that I've had a discussion with. Look at FIFA, for example. They found a way to sell a game every year with a solid microtransaction system implemented whereby people are okay with it. Very often, it results in horrific patterns of every other year we get a decent one, but the solution peddled to this is simply, oh well, it didn't work, wait till next year's release. And the real question we should ask is if this element has snuck into gaming or whether it has been intentionally implemented slowly over time in order to keep the original generations of console PC gamers from having the meltdowns we're currently seeing on release for most new game releases. That would be the grand inquisition, so to speak. And I think that is definitely the case, that this is where they wanted to go to. I think it's probably a little bit more organic than is made out here, that it's, you know, it's, it's not like some dark evil scheme but uh, but I do think just by current trends they've been very very aware of the fact that they're catering to kind of two quite different markets in the same sphere and have to be very tentative you know treading on eggshells but now they've gotten to the point where maybe you know one is tailoring off and the other one is kind of you know coming to the fore and so they're just like fuck it let's just go all in you know and I think that's where they've been trying to push anyway they're trying to sit they're trying to find the line they're trying to push the line and find out like what they can get away with which is what I've been saying all along 
He says, welcome to hypercapitalism, guys. They've been using it to bend people over in every other realm of life for decades, and now the virtual world is under assault by its nascent evil tentacles too. To explain my point about profit incentive as a wider issue, the concerns become less about making a marketable, worthwhile and stable product in a profit driven business. Essentially, you know, it's not about the game, it's literally about what you're making out of that game. It becomes about maximizing profit whilst having the least expenditure and highest repurchasability as is humanly possible. You see this in everything from pharmaceuticals to cars to houses to household items like televisions and kettles. Maximize profit at the expense of virtually every other element of the product. To translate this to gaming, it's become about releasing a brand. This is why you see things like the Battlefield brand, the Star Wars Battlefront brand. It's why you see brands like Need for Speed, FIFA. It's like it's a franchise. It's about marketing that sort of sphere of gaming, the product. People want to get into it as a large, wider scale thing. It's why you see the same thing with like Destiny, Mass Effect, um, you know, even like Overwatch. Many, and you're going to say, well, that's just a game series. So that, yeah, but you've got to look at like how they're sort of trying to like tag people in and, and push it and brand it and market it. He says that is then able to be marketed every year, every other year, with the integration of a system that enables companies to take continued income as the games are played, even after their purchase, which again is another thing that we've been talking and covering. This has resulted in the mass ditching of a competent and challenging single player slash split screen system, which was a commonality among games for nearly four decades, and is being replaced en masse by poor quality and often extremely poorly developed tested multiplayer scenarios. There is no intention for all these games to be maintained or even played beyond a two year lifespan. And I point directly to EA for being guilty of cultivating this approach as they've done with previous FIFA games as well as the likes of Command & Conquer where they shut down multiplayer servers after a preset passing of time at product release. Ultimately, there is no way around this anymore. It's become an industry standard, just as designing electrical items to fail outside of legal warranty constraints has been within the computing household item industries. Indie games are a feasible one, but there are so few that really give you an epic experience comparable with what we can expect of a AAA game titles in the 90s and early, I'm going to say 2000s. I, I, I refuse to say the other version of that. Um, sorry for the rant on your otherwise relatively small point. Um, but you know, uh, Dax makes a lot of good points, very well made points, very sensible, very demonstrable, very logical points there. And this is the kind of thing that we've been covering and talking about and discussing is that, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say like, don't be too cynical, but at the same time, they're not even trying hard to cover this you know they're not even trying hard to be covert about this and that's really been my issue around star wars battlefront it's so blatant uh and it's why it makes me conclude that they've sort of realized hey this is the tipping point in 2017 like they've been softly trying to kind of implement things over time they've been pushing the idea of like more in-game purchases all this kind of stuff we see it across the industry and it feels like this year is the year where they were just kind of like screw it let's just go all in just go all in and we'll see what happens, you know? Um, whether that was like a calculated gamble, I would argue it actually has not quite paid off. Um, I think that I think that the world is not quite ready yet for this level of things. And then at the same time, you've got Strauss Zelnick from Take Two, as we were discussing last time around uh, with Red Dead Redemption, and also all apparent future Take Two games. And they're just saying like, yeah, screw it. Yeah, we're, we're doing this. It's gonna be in all our titles. You know, they're just saying, yeah, we're going all in. We're going to put it in everything. Um, we don't care. That's what's going to happen now. And, uh, you know, they're not isolated. Like I say, this is an industry-wide issue now. It's just what your experience is going to be like from here on out, at least on these large-scale AAA levels. And it's also why I was saying the other day that maybe the direction for most people is like, you know, you find like one AAA game that you like and maybe that you can deal with. Um, and then beyond that, maybe you start playing more mid-level and even indie games. I mean, in indie and mid-level games are looking a lot better, a lot more polished, a lot more professional. And I, I don't like to say professional, it sounds too negative, it sounds really condescending. But, you know, it's like, they are, they're, they're of a higher standard than you would have seen years ago. And uh, it's, it's really impressive, um, it's really laudable, and um, it's really thankful as well for us as players to actually have those alternate options away from these big companies. But another point I make as well is that, you know, I, I want to have a conversation about publishing. Might this actually backfire? 
I mean, right now we're just thinking of it in terms of, well, hey, these big publishers are doing these things. There's no other opportunity. There's nothing else for it to do. Like I said before, look at like Frontier, where they're self-publishing. There are several games, big games, that are self-publishing now. Maybe we start to see the games industry head towards a focus of self-publishing and just more kind of like uh, less deceitful systems, you know? Like, why is it? that you have to have a bloody reddit thread where people are working out the maths of these things for people to realize like hey actually this system is shitty you know it's like why does it take like a whole kind of reddit conspiracy theory to figure this stuff out it's like if that's where we are that is not good like that is not good if it's taking like full-on conspiracy theory tinfoil hat level to get into the real n n teeth of this it's that's what should be disturbing people is that it's not clear cut. It's not just out there and, and they go like, oh yeah, so this is how long it's going to take and you can figure it out real easy. It's like, no, they, they try and hide it in like the meta of the game. And that's what should be disturbing because it, it just seems really deceitful. And it, it's not too much of a logical conclusion to make off of that, that they're trying to hide it because they know what they're doing is kind of fucked up. Okay, Sanogen says, Lutin, subscribe to your channel about four or five years ago for Battlefield, which I always find ridiculous. Uh, it was so long ago. When you stopped making BF videos, I put away your channel away. Didn't unsub because I knew you could do some awesome stuff. And below the line is exactly the stuff that we've been waiting for from you. Maybe drop it to one upload a week, as we're doing today, but you should totally continue this series. It's very entertaining to watch, and the interaction between you and the community is awesome. So I'll say thank you for that. And as far as take two and monetization of single player games go, fuck those assholes. Their modern games are a grind fest because of their policy. I urge those who read this comment to resist the temptation of buying their games. Don't support them with your money. Judging by GTA 5, microtransactions will be the absolute focus from them from now on. And, you know, this is kind of what we've been talking about as well what's the right thing to do should you deny yourself uh, a game which could potentially have some enjoyment in it at the base value price just for the sake of it having microtransactions in it do you need to send a bigger message it's debatable it's completely debatable and whilst i might say and other people may say just don't buy that game I can completely understand people looking at something like Red Dead 2 and thinking, well, you know, maybe it's got some microtransactions in there, but I really want to play that game. I can understand that. And it's difficult for me too. Like, I probably really, really want to play Red Dead 2. But it just depends on how strongly you want to send a message. Do you want to send a message by simply not buying any microtransactions? Or do you want to send a message by not buying the game itself? But I actually think, you know, a combination of any of these things as well as actively talking about it. Don't keep your opinions to yourself. Share them with other people. Go online, tweet about it, write on forums about it, you know, get involved. That's what it's about. It's about getting involved, sharing that opinion, and hopefully, um, you know, awakening some people who maybe haven't thought of these things. It's surprising often when you talk to people, how often they just say, oh yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. So that's probably one of the most positive things people could be doing. This is a really short one from Dino, says, uh, this is an interesting series, recently discovered the channel. Uh, LT, do you think executives, devs from EA, Activision, Ubisoft watch this kind of stuff on your channel? What I mean by that are, are they watching this so they can find out other ways to improve next generation <laughs> microtransactions? Um, the reason I just highlighted this topic, this, this question, is because I don't know about executives, probably not, but I do know that... Uh, and this isn't to big myself up because I'm pretty sure it's their kind of job essentially to kind of keep an eye on the community, whether it's me or other producers. Um, I know that this stuff does get watched. Maybe not every video, but I know it gets watched. I know that marketing guys watch this kind of stuff on, like, like I say, not just my channel, other channels. That is kind of their role is to kind of look at what people are talking about, how they're presenting it, the mood of the community. That's kind of what they do. Uh, because if they didn't know that, they wouldn't be able to do their job. So they have to keep an eye on it. So it's kind of like marketing. You will find some devs as well watching stuff. Um, I mean, it was always a shock to me back in the days of Battlefield with like Bad Company when I was talking about things. Um, I think one of the first EA events I went to, when one of the devs was trying to find me to talk to me which was like mind-blowing i was just like what the what like they why do they want to talk to me it's weird and it's it's funny it's like so devs yeah they do watch it um and i remember back in the day when i was doing a lot of stuff about battlefield i remember um some devs messaging me as well and saying like oh yeah when lt post a video it got shared around the office which also was super weird to me like that's the really bizarre thing it's like i never felt like my uh i never felt like my channel or content gained enough traction to be worthwhile of that but apparently it did so you know i guess good um anyway so next up 
Exile, who says the publishers have repeatedly tried to raise the uh, RRP, the price of games. I remember they tried doing the release of the PS3, and I remember this as well. They were charging as much as £60. It does appear the maximum a consumer is going to pay for the average game is about £40. And I remember they, they did try to do this. They say that larger devs and publishers want a formula. They want a template to mitigate risk and effort. EA would love every one of their games to be as easy to develop as their sports franchises. That is a super good point to make. Nobody makes that point. It is a really good point to make. Knocking essentially the same thing out every year. These publishers need to remember their creative industry and allow the developers to be creative and artistic. But Exile makes a ridiculously good point, and a point that I actually haven't really seen many other people make before, which is the link and the comparison between the sports games that EA turns out versus the more kind of creative games that they turn out like the stuff that's Battlefield and Star Wars Battlefront and to a lesser degree I guess like Need for Speed and things like this and it's like it's a really really excellent comparison to make there because when you think about it sports games and I have never understood this I have never understood really how not just in games but in sports in general I've never understood how the fan base of sports just buy into the fact that it's like yeah every year we're going to change it up and charge you for the privilege and it's like what it's just a bizarre thing I have never really understood that but um, feel free to explain but yeah so you can completely understand that EA are literally like in one hand they've got these sports series which they can literally just kind of change up a little bit repackage bang ship it out good money in the bank do you know what I mean and these other things require all this effort and all this thinking and all trying to work it out because they're a lot deeper there's a lot more going on with them and again I don't mean to be disrespectful to sports games but when you look at something like the Battlefield series I'm sorry but I think there is a little bit more there's a little bit more intricacy and thought process in there although maybe now that's slightly debatable but anyway um you get where I'm coming from, is that they can kind of look to one hand and see this thing and then they look to the other where they see that it's essentially a more unstable, you know, it's not so consistent, it's an unknown quantity as to how well it's going to do. And they're just like, hey, can't we just have all our games be really like repeatable and we just make a ton of money from every single one? You know, like if you're sitting at the top of a business, of course that's what you want. It doesn't work that way. Um, but it is a really good comparison to make and uh, you know one that I think people should keep in mind uh, Well going forward when we see the development of titles right last up Warner and that's uh, two last comments in a row for you Warner So you have to go some this week to uh, get on the uh, board next time around uh, He says if the stats are there you can't blame them for trying it This is take two and Red Dead 2 but sure hopefully it's a phase the stats told Crytek that mobile gaming was the future So they left console and then we got no more crisis games Grr. Hopefully it's done well and good humored with Rockstar it's how it's done. That's the problem, like you say, with pay to win or cosmetics for casual versus 24 7 um, players and streamers. He says if people like Ali A, and by the way, I don't think he's calling out Ali A here, I think he's just using as an example a big person's name. So it could be anyone, it could be Jack, it could be Level, you know, it doesn't matter. Just, you know, big producers. Uh, from If they're making money from streaming the said game, and it gets money from viewers to open loot crates for the viewers so that they don't have to, who is it's really getting shafted? Like one of the comments said, it's about whether you yourself have an addictive personality or are bad with money. It's just a storm that we've got to bunker down and wait out, and if people are talking about said loot crates, that in itself is free trending promotion, which is a good point to make. So people will milk the cow even when the bucket is full. So I think really where he's getting at here is that this thing is kind of unstoppable, it's just happening, and you can already see, which is kind of also the point that I've been making on and off, is that you can kind of see that it's just happening, and there isn't a lot you can do about it. I feel there are actions that you can take, and if you feel about it, and you're responsible about it, and you want to actually get involved and take action on it, there are things you can do, as I've highlighted, like talking about it, um, talking to people, sharing the issues, maybe voting with your wallet, you know, and... But I think in a larger scheme of things, like he said, when you have big producers that are just covering the game, not in a particularly, not in a particularly biased way even. So when you have a big YouTube producer or streamer or someone, and they're not really even pushing these ideas. They're not saying like, hey guys, make sure you pick up the crates or blah, 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 blah. No, no, they're just playing the game because that's what you do if you're a producer and you're a streamer. You just play the game. Um, I actively avoided streaming any of uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2. I've, I've made you know some recordings that I can use for videos and stuff and I haven't purchased the game is the other thing I had a few people saying LT I thought you were not going to uh, buy the game blah 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 this is just the uh, 10 hour trial that I have played I don't intend to actually pick up the game I also had said that um, I was going to go really in depth and do a full review and 
that's because I wasn't anticipating it kind of blowing up in the way it has with everyone analysing things. I actually think there's don't any, not any need for me to do so, which I'm quite thankful for because the idea of grinding through this game just to produce that video was not one that I was particularly looking forward to. Um, so I'm actually probably going to opt out of that. Um, but I will have a, a sort of an overview of my 10 hours of play um, to kind of give you my thoughts of where I am with that, which I think is about the most I want to do. I think that's probably a good thing to do as well, is to kind of go through and do like a, you know, I've done 10 hours and this is why I don't want to get the game. Um, the long and short of it is, I just find the game kind of boring in the same way that I found Star Wars Battlefront the first time around kind of boring. You know, after you've played it for like five, six hours, you're like, yeah, I get it. You run around and shoot at shit. It's like, and, and that sounds so dismissive and kind of like um, a throwaway sort of token comment to make, but it's a funny one. It's it's similar, like, you know, arguably any FPS, what do you do? Run around and shoot. So, but it's, it's there's so, so little thought in what's going on. And I'm sure there's people can be like, oh, no, no, you know, if you're a really good player, yeah, whatever, you just run around and blast shit. Like, that's all there is to it. I mean, you can just literally see it in the gameplay now. This, this gameplay now is pretty much every gameplay of every round that you play. Bottleneck, and then everyone just starts, like, caning it with the blasters, and, like, that's basically it. This is your gameplay. It's just this ad nauseum. It's just over and over and over and over. Endless. Okay, now we come to the second part of the episode. This is where I discuss the topic for next week. You guys will primarily comment about it down below, but feel free to discuss any of the things that we were covering today. Now, my topic for today is, is this whole issue bigger than EA? I think the obvious answer to that is obviously yes, but really we're talking about where do we go now that this whole crate fiasco is out and has been pretty roundly condemned by the gaming community. I think you'd struggle to say EA have not come out of this looking pretty terrible though, both from a literal and ethical perspective and also for just badly judging the mood of public opinion when it comes to the mechanics and general implementation of their crates system, coupled with the stagnant amount of credits earned for progression. What I'm asking today is, do you feel like I say, this is bigger than EA? The concepts implemented in Star Wars Battlefront 2 are nothing that should surprise anybody. Moreover, it's just a bit shocking to see just how blatant they were pushed onto the players and how shamelessly they've been interjected into all elements of the game's design. It doesn't feel like an outside extra e detail, it's woven into the game core itself. And I think that's one reason why in the videos of other producers that I have seen so far, they actually struggle, even people that are really positive usually about EA uh, titles, they've really struggled to ignore this issue because you can't ignore it. That's the point, you can't. Everyone that is making content about this game is in some way, even whether they go softer or harder on it, has to address the issue because you can't ignore it. It's literally bled into the game core itself. So there's no way of getting around it and just pretending it doesn't exist. It's right there. It's so blatant in your face, you can't get away from it. But like I say, put that to one side, it goes beyond EA. It's a wider issue in my opinion. Look at, like we said, Take Two last time. Recently they want to implement microtransaction systems in all future titles. It wants to be a thing that they just put across the board. The sheer insanity of the social loot crate sharing in COD World War II, which by the way also has daily bonus stuff along with Star Wars Battlefront 2's daily crates. What are these for? They're to try and remind people, hey, listen, Remember to do your microtransactions, you know? It's it's stuff like that, and it's just so blatant. You're just like, oh my god. Um, it's all starting to feel much like the way in which industries who push habit-forming recreational pursuits like smoking, alcohol, and gambling, it's the way in which they push their things. Those hooks, reminders, triggers to try and get people desensitized to the idea of these systems. And when you look at stuff like smoking, alcohol, gambling, and even sugar based products, you often find that governments and, you know, committees that deal with things in the government across a country have actually started to clamp down pretty heavily on those habit forming industries recently. And where I come to with this is, do we need to start thinking about that when it comes to gaming as well? Now to be clear, when it comes to loot crates, loot boxes, microtransaction, technically most of these, if not all of these, are not actually gambling by its true definition, okay? But as I responded to someone earlier today, let's not wrap ourselves up splitting hairs here, okay? It's not the process that's the issue in that with gambling, you need to see some kind of form of payout to you eventually. This is a grayer area than that. It's kind of like soft gambling. Gambling for children, let's say. Everybody's a winner as well. Um, as I said before, it's more about the direction here 
that's most troubling. The closing of Visceral recently so that we can reevaluate that Star Wars game into something more open world, read easier to monetize. When you join the dots, it all leads toward a future of AAA gaming which is focused entirely around in-game monetization and habit-forming crate culture. Now recently the issue of gambling in games was brought up in actually UK government and I start to wonder, is this something that soon is going to need to be more heavily regulated? I actually think the answer to that is yes, because when you consider that we don't allow other habitual forming activities that are deliberately designed to hook kids in, then why should we allow this? It's why, as an example, in the UK, advertising of sugary products to children was heavily curbed in 2016. That was done by the uh, Committee for Advertising Practice Rules. Uh, they ruled to ban adverts of junk food aimed at children online, in print, on TV and cinemas. Now, the reason being that they had done research which showed children aged 5 to 15 were shown to spend a minimum of 15 hours online each week and the advertising greatly influenced uh, what food that they chose to eat. Now who knows how effective that that has been since those decisions were taken but the point is that there is a demonstrable action that advertising and in turn the way something is projected toward an audience was having an effect on the consumer and that might seem like an obvious statement to make marketing affects its audience well if it didn't it wouldn't exist and so obviously it does but what i want to remind people is that this is why putting in systems into a game like crate systems can be potentially damaging to people and not maybe in a literal sense right there and then but down the line it's not a crazy concept to suggest that the way in which we are seeing these daily repeatable practices implemented into games could become very addictive for some people and then push someone softly toward other forms of say gambling later along the line i actually wanted to talk further about this with somebody who knows more than myself so i'm going to be trying to find somebody to discuss this issue with i've already made some contact points about that today and this whole thing has been really bothering me as we've seen it sweep across the games industry this year. And like I said, it's not isolated to Star Wars Battlefront. Think of mobile games as well. It's definitely not isolated to AAA titles either. Uh, mobile gaming in general is a really depressing situation when you start playing some of those games. And I'm just going to repeat what I've said before. Uh, I don't think I'm being overly dramatic here or unnecessarily hysterical. Um, I mean, just look at the general advertising of mobile gaming, especially a lot of these, um, you know, Clash of Clans and all these kind of games and some of these sort of more RTS-ish, but not RTS at all, um, games where they, they show, you know, the Commander games or whatever, all these different things, and they advertise those games and they literally, they, they do these really high rendered things which would bear zero resemblance to the games whatsoever. And then at the very end, they just throw in a little bit of gameplay because they have to do that legally. And it's just like... They're literally trying to con people to get into their game because they know that once they get people on the game, there's going to be a certain percentage of those people who just can't get away from their microtransaction BS and that's where they make their money. It's so really shady and honestly, I think it really does need much heavier regulation uh, from government than we currently have. You really do have to think how these systems in games could shape people's habits and in turn their lives further down the line. It's too dismissive and it's way too easy to talk about stuff like personal responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't live in a world where everybody just lives for themselves, okay? It's not, we don't live in a kind of crazy dystopian nightmare. It's not wrong to have expectations of standards and responsibility when it comes to marketing, advertising, and protecting impressionable people for habit-forming addictive practices. That's where we are this week on Below the Line, guys. Like I say, Wednesday slots now, so I'm going to see you next week for Below the Line. Please drop your comments and thoughts down below about this whole thing with the industry. Thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this and you like this series, drop a like, drop a comment. It helps me out, helps the series out, helps the channel out. And if you want to see this more, you want to see this series grow, you want to get people more involved, share it. Share it with other people. Let people know the topics of conversation that are going on. Thanks for watching, guys. I'm going to see you next week for more Below the Line.